All right, welcome to Love 40 Tennis uh, Racket Springing Series. This is part two, uh, getting set up. In this, we are going to talk about how to decipher a string pattern, understanding the string pattern of your racket. We'll talk a little bit about string tension and string selection. And then finally, in this portion of the series, we will get the racket set up onto the machine, ready for stringing. Okay, let's quickly talk about string patterns. Uh, tennis rackets have a number of different stringing patterns, which is referencing the main strings, which are the long vertical ones, and the number of crosses, period. Common string patterns would be 16 mains by 18 crosses, 16 by 19, or 18 by 20. The number of mains is always listed first. Less common patterns would be 16 by 20 or 18 by 19. And knowing this string pattern is relevant for when you start to string, what are the differences? A more open pattern, which means fewer total strings or larger squares created by the string pattern themselves, will give you better access to spin, uh, perhaps a little bit more power. Um, a dense pattern means that more strings are coming in contact with the ball at contact, which is going to give you more control and precision. Um, and those are the trade-offs when considering sort of racket selection. But in this case, we're only concerned about what the pattern is because that is going to affect how we string the racket. You can always go to the racket manufacturer website to find the pattern. Oftentimes the pattern is listed on the racket itself. And when in doubt, you could always count on a strong racket so you know which are the crosses and which are the mains. Um, the numbers to get the string pattern. Once you know the pattern, you can go to the racket manufacturer's website to find the actual stringing pattern chart, which is going to tell you directly how you string the racket. Um, each company should have that on their website. For example, here is Wilson's website, or Prince's website, or Head's website. Each website will be a little bit different, but you are essentially looking for the string instructions or string pattern. When in doubt, you can go to the Clipper USA website. Uh, they have tremendous information about stringing rackets of all ages. So if you have an older racket or can't seem to find the stringing pattern, uh, go to the clipperusa.com website. Um, it is a great resource. Okay, let's go to a stringing chart itself. This one is for the Wilson Pro Staff, uh, one of my favorite rackets. Um, the first thing you're going to see is whether or not you're going to do a one-piece or two-piece stringing. It is going to tell you the length of string that you need. So in this chart, you can see uh, for one-piece stringing, you need a single 38-foot length of string. Um, if you're going to do two-piece stringing, you need a 20-foot piece of string for the mains and an 18-foot piece of string for the crosses. I've found, honestly, that once you get comfortable stringing, you can probably shave a little bit off of these numbers, um, maybe as much as a foot um, on two-piece stringing for each. It is really going to come down to tying the knots at the end and how comfortable you are with that. Okay, what about the H's and T's? For those in the medical world, they may remember the H's and T's of ACLS as a way of thinking about causes of cardiac arrest. But in the tennis world, H stands for head, which is the tip of the racket, and T stands for throat, which is down by the grip. So the numbering system will give a numbering of the grommet at either the head or the throat of the racket. Of course, you need to remember that the numbering system counts all grommet holes from the center main string, so make sure you don't skip over any, particularly the crosses when counting. Here's a quick picture of counting of the throat grommets. You can see that they are tied off at what would be 6T, and you can see that the seventh grommet is a cross string, and the eighth grommet would then, of course, be a, another main. So keep that in mind. Again, you do not want to miscount the grommet holes. So let's go to an example in this stringing chart. For one piece stringing, the instructions call for the mains to transition to the crosses at the bottom, listed at 7T. 7T means to count seven grommet holes from the center at the throat of the racket. That will be right here. 
And bear in mind, there is one main just before you get to the cross, which is 7T. The instructions go on to say that the crosses will be tied off at 5H, so that will be five grommet holes from the center at the head of the racket, which will be here. For two-piece stringing, the first thing you will want to notice is the two upward-facing arrows at the center of the racket at the throat, right there. This is telling you that this is where the mains get strung from, where it is started. It then shows two downward-facing arrows laterally on both sides of the racket, and this is where the main stringing will be completed. I have found that the mains can be tied off pretty much anywhere from this last grommet hole. I do like to keep the tie-offs symmetric, as you can see here, just to make it look neat and tidy. The crosses start at 7H and tie off at 5H up at the head of the racket. For more information about stringing the crosses, please see my other videos. I will provide links in the discussion and comments section below. The crosses then finish and tie off at the bottom or throat of the racket at 11T shown here. While that is the recommendation, I usually just try to find a grommet hole that I can get to the string through to tie off. Now you may have realized that it is not necessarily intuitive how to divvy up the single 38 foot length string when doing one piece stringing. With two piece stringing, it is fairly straightforward. The mains start in the middle and work their way out to either side, and therefore you start with symmetric lengths of the 20-foot main string. However, on one-piece stringing, what do you do? This chart lists that in one-piece stringing, you will have a short side of 10 feet, so the side that is going out and just completing the mains but not running into the crosses will be only 10 feet, while the remaining 28 feet will be dedicated to completing the mains on the side that then runs into the crosses. This is somewhat intuitive, as with two-piece stringing, you have a 20-foot piece of string to do the entire mains stringing, which would be 10 feet for each half of the racket. Therefore, the short side of a one-piece stringing should be 10 feet to complete just that side. So let's now talk about different types of strings and how it affects stringing. I'm not really going to discuss the playability or the benefits of the different types of strings here. That will be a separate video. Uh, but first, I wanted to show you the synthetic gut, or also called nylon, and sort of what it looks like. And it is a very, I would call, stringy type string. Um, it's very easy to thread and weave uh, because it's very forgiving. You can see it sort of goes through, um, ties off pretty easily. Um, I have a pretty simple knot that I tied with my hand right there. It's very easy. It's very easy to manipulate. On the flip side is polyester or poly. Um, this is all old string. You can even just see by how kinked this string is that it's much more rigid. Um, and when it comes to stringing, that will definitely have an effect on how you string, um, getting it down, cinching off knots, and so forth. Um, this is a slightly different poly. I tried to tie off this knot. I couldn't even cinch it close. It's so sort of rigid. I would need clamps or something to really tighten it off. You can see also sort of how kinked it is naturally, having removed it from a racket. Now, there are benefits to each kind of string. Uh, what I mean by that is the synthetic gut is going to be much easier to weave. When you are doing your crosses and you are weaving over, under, over, under the mains, uh, something like a synthetic gut is going to be a lot more easy to manipulate as you're going back and forth on the racket. However, getting it through the last grommet hole to tie off can be challenging. The racket will be completely strung by that point, so when you're tying off your last knot, you will need to get your 
last bit of string through a grommet that already has string through it. Well, if you're using something like nylon or synthetic gut, that is going to be very hard because it is not rigid. It is classically going to sort of bend the string rather than getting through the hole. However, weaving with a polyester string is more challenging. It's very rigid. Trying to go over and under the following strings um, will be difficult. But getting it through that last hole, you oftentimes have a little bit more rigidity with which to then get it through the last grommet for the tie-off. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, when I was practicing, I would first start with the nylon strings. I found it easy to weave the crosses, but very difficult to get through the last grommet. On the flip side, polyester was much more difficult to weave the crosses with, but I found it less difficult to get through the final grommet to tie off at the end. I wanted to conclude uh, by talking about getting the racket secure and level on the stringing machine. I am using a Torna 300 CS stringing machine, which has six points of contact with the racket. The first two points um, are at the very base or throat of the racket and the tip or head of the racket. And I put those in first to get the racket generally secure before I start using the other four points of contact, which are those uh, clamp-like things that you see along the sides. You can see me turning the larger knobs uh, to get the racket completely level. Those last four points are what actually level the racket, but it is the first two points of contact with the smaller dials that actually secure the racket. Some stringing machines may only have two points of contact for the racket, which will be uh, those two smaller clamps at the very base and very tip of the racket head. Um, and it'll be very important in that situation to make sure the racket is completely level, as you will not have these other four points of contact, um, which I am using the larger dials to then use to help level the racket itself. Overall, you will want to make sure that the racket is both level and very secure and snug in the machine before you start stringing and pulling tension. You don't want to clamp the racket too hard to the machine as that could actually weaken the frame, but should be snug enough such that when you are pulling tension that the racket itself is not moving or wobbling. Thank you for watching this video by Love40 Tennis. If you found it helpful, please like the video and subscribe to my channel. Um, thank you again for watching. Remember, at Love40 Tennis, it is always triple break point.